Greetings one and all. In this video we're going to be looking at mesh analysis. Mesh analysis is another technique like nodal that will produce a set of simultaneous equations that we can solve and give us a set of answers. In this case we're going to use Kirchhoff's voltage law instead of Kirchhoff's current law as we did in nodal. Um, the end result will give us a series of what are called mesh currents and based on those results, those mesh currents, we can find voltages across various components or at various nodes as need be. Mesh is uh, in some respects a little bit more convenient than nodal. Nodal has the one downside that you're always dealing with uh, uh, reciprocals, right? It's uh, conductance instead of resistance. It's susceptance instead of reactance, admittance instead of um, impedance. Uh, in this case we get to use a direct value. So the way to think about this is in a nodal analysis, you know, we're basically using Ohm's law in this form, right? I is equal to like, you know, 1 over Z times um, a voltage. Whereas, and there's, you know, a bunch of these. In the case of mesh, it's more like voltage is some impedance times a current, right? And then there's a bunch of these. So that's one plus side to it. Um, the downside is, you know, we're getting currents and we're getting mesh currents, not um, branch currents, and we'll define the difference in a moment. So that's not quite as convenient as nodal, which gives us really what we usually want, which are voltages. You know, that's usually more convenient for us. The other issue with mesh, and practically speaking it's not a huge issue, but it does exist, uh, that is nodal can solve virtually any circuit. Mesh is limited to what are called planar circuits. Those are circuits that um, you, if you draw them on a piece of paper, a flat piece of paper, it's possible to draw them such that all of the uh, wires and so forth components don't cross. It's possible to come up with circuits where that's not true, where um, you can't draw it, you can't redraw it such that components aren't crossing. Nodal doesn't have a problem with that. Mesh does. We have to have uh, planar circuits. But most circuits that we uh, deal with in the real world um, tend to be planar circuits. So that's not a practical limitation for the most part. So let's just begin with one. This can work with um, a mix of voltage sources and current sources, just voltage sources. Um, as a matter of fact, we're going to look at, in a second video, a, um, uh, another way of approaching this, just like we had an inspection method for nodal, there's also an ins inspection method for mesh, and we will look at that. But for right now, let's just start with a small circuit that just has two voltage sources and just a handful of components, right? So I'll have a source over here, E1. We'll put on uh, reference polarities plus minus. We have some inductor L, which of course will give us a JXL over here. I'm going to put a resistor down like this. And then across a capacitor, right? Minus JX sub C, whatever that is. And then a second voltage source with the following reference polarity. Um, we've already looked at a way of solving this, actually a couple of ways. You could do um, source conversions on these, turn these into current sources, right? The E1 and, and the inductor, E2 and the capacitor, turn those into current sources with parallel components, you'd have an all parallel circuit and then you could solve for whatever this node voltage is. The other way to do that would be uh, to use superposition. Right? We would consider E1 by itself, consider E2 by itself, figure out the contributions to the output, voltage across here, for example, um, add them up, off we go. And of course, the third way would be use nodal. Uh, general approach, if you're going to use nodal directly, um, we would find this node voltage, or in this case, it would be kind of clunky, but you could do source conversions, um, in which case you don't have one node, so you might as well just uh, you know, go back and, and just take the, the all-parallel thing that we mentioned initially. But we have multiple ways, so this is just one more um, approach that we can use. So uh, in a bigger circuit, you know, mesh might turn out to be the most efficient way to solve it. All depends. It's good to have multiple tools, right? So this relies on Kirchhoff's 
voltage law. All right, summation of voltages around a loop have to be zero. Or we could think of that as the summation of voltage rises has to equal the summation of voltage drops. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to define a couple of loops in here, little KVL loops. So here's my first one. And I'm going to call the, this current, this blue current, if you will, I'm going to call that I1. Now that's what we call a mesh current. Right? It's not necessarily a branch current. It might be. We can see that, for example, I1 does flow through E1, and it flows through the inductor. And given this polarity, this, this direction, we will get um, voltages with the following reference polarities, plus to minus on the inductor and plus to minus on the resistor. Okay. Now, the fact that I drew this thing clockwise is just a convention. There's nothing magic about that, but what we will do is draw all of them in the same convention. So I'm going to continue with my circuit and draw more of these little loops. Now, we have to make sure that every single component is in, a, in one loop, at least one loop. It may be in two loops, but it's got to be in at least one loop. We want the minimum number of smallest, most compact loops. So the next loop we would create would look like this, right? I2. Now, if I had a bigger circuit, maybe I had something come up over here, I'd have a third loop up here. Maybe there was something coming off this way, I'd have a third loop over here, right? Maybe a fourth loop up there, who knows? So I have all these loops. Um, these are roughly analogous to the nodes that we would have in nodal analysis. And just as in nodal analysis, the number of nodes tells you how many equations you have, how many unknowns you have, the number of loops you have um, in a mesh analysis tells you the same thing. In other words, how many equations we're going to have and how many answers, in this case, mesh currents we're going to wind up with. Continuing along with our I1 over here, excuse me, I, I2 over here, given this clockwise orientation, we would have this sort of polarity across R, this polarity across the capacitor, and of course we already have a defined polarity, um, reference polarity on our source E2. So now I would go and apply KVL to each of these loops. Looking at the first loop, what we would see is that the drop created by the source E1, right, minus the plus, so we have two drops here, plus to minus, plus to minus on the inductor and the resistor. Now I want to write those in terms of their Ohm's law equivalence, right? We're getting back to this kind of stuff. So what's the Ohm's law equivalent for the drop across the inductor? Well, it's I1 times the reactance. Okay, so you could just say, well, that's JXL times the current through it, I1. Great. What's the drop across R? Well, same deal. It's the current through it times the resistance. But what is the current through it? Well, the current through it is a combination of currents. We have the blue I1 and we have the orange I2. So that's R times the combination of currents. Well, how do I add those? Well, you know, I1's coming down, I2's going up. We look at the polarities, they're fighting each other. Since I'm in loop one, this is my reference, I'm going to say that's I1 minus I2. Right? I2 fights I1. This is where the term mesh comes from. These, it's kind of like uh, you know, gears here, sort of meshing, if you could imagine all of these things going along. Um, so that's always going to be the case. And this is important why we always say everybody's clockwise, everybody's clockwise. Because it's always going to work out on any given component if there are two currents going through them. One is going in the opposite direction of the other. That's an important thing. So there's our first equation, basically. We could now simplify this, just like we did with nodal, and say, okay, E1, you know, what are my coefficients for my I1s? Well, I've got a JXL and I've got an R, so let me stick those together. So this is R plus JXL times I1. All right, so that's the coefficient for I1. And then I have my I2 coefficient, negative I2 times R. So that's a negative R times I2. So negative R is the coefficient for I2. That's my first equation. And we are good. All right. Now we turn our attention over to the second loop. All right. So I have I2. I'll go around here and do the same thing. 
what do I have in terms of rises and drops? Well, if you notice, going in this clockwise direction, it's plus to minus, plus to minus, plus to minus. So we could say zero equals this plus this plus this as far as voltages. Or uh, a way I like to approach this is to just say, look, remember that minus to plus is going to be a rise and plus to minus is going to be a drop. And think of it like this, sum of rises, sum of drops. So where, uh, how do I approach this, right? Well, I2 is coming out of the negative terminal. This shows up negative, right? It's coming out of the negative terminal. So um, we could show that as negative on the, on the rise side of the equation. In other words, I can say a negative E2 has got to be equal to the drop on the resistor plus the drop on the capacitor. Okay. So same deal. Let's find the uh, Ohm's law equivalence of these two things. Um, the drop across the resistor, we're in the similar sort of situation we were last time. The drop across the resistor is two currents. But I'm in the I2 loop now, so I'm going to call this I2 minus I1. I1 is the fighting current. It's the opposing current. So uh, we can just say uh, the, the drop across that resistor is R times I2 minus I1, right? So you see what's going on with these two things, right? We're in loop one, so it's loop one minus loop two. We're in loop two, so it's loop two minus loop one. It's a simple sort of formula, uh, recipe, if you will, that we follow. All right, what's the drop across VC in terms of Ohm's law? Well, that would be um, the current through it times minus Jx of C. The current through it is uh, I2. So that's just a negative Jx sub C times the I2. And we're going to do the same thing, gather up our various terms, see what we have. So my I1 terms, I only have the 1. i got a negative I1R over here. So I've got a negative R times I1. And my I2 terms, I've got an R over here, and I've got a negative uh, Jx sub C. So we'll stick those together, right? R minus J X sub C times I2. All right? That's my second equation. Now let's just put those together. I'm going to rewrite these. So we have E1 equals R plus J X sub L times I1 minus R I2. Second equation is a negative E2 equals a negative R times I1 plus R minus J X sub C I2. Just as we did in the nodal analysis, we want to check for diagonal symmetry here. This is only a 2 by 2, so it's pretty easy to see. Negative R, negative R. All right, major diagonal is positive. Looking good. Now I can solve this using the same techniques that we used for nodal. And what we'll come up with, of course, will be two mesh currents. In other words, we'll come up with answers for I1 and I2, you know, whatever they work out to. Now I have to go back, given these currents, go back into the original circuit and determine you know, what the voltages are on various components. Now in the case of the inductor, that's fairly straightforward because the only current flowing through here is I1. So, you know, just to use some round numbers, if, if I1 just happened to equal, you know, 1 at an angle of 0, let's just say, um, and my uh, inductive reactance was, you know, J10, okay, well, that's 10 at an angle of 90 times the 1. I'm going to get uh, 10 volts at an angle of 90, and that's what I would see across here with this reference polarity. Right? Straightforward computation. Um, on the other hand, the resistor is a little bit trickier because that has two currents flowing through it. It's got the same one going down, but it's got I2 coming up. All right, I, I1 going down, I2 coming up. So to find that voltage, the voltage across this resistor, which you know maybe we'll just call this like node A, right? There's ground. So if I said, hey, what what is VA? Right? What's the, the node voltage at A? Well, um, to drop across the resistor. So given, given the polarity, if I'm going to assume that VA is positive reference polarity, that's my blue polarity over here, uh, 
then I'm going to say that must be the R value times whatever I have for I1 minus I2. All right. So the current through the resistor is the meshing current pair. It's the two of them. All right. So if I had one amp coming down and I had uh, you know um, half an amp at 42 degrees coming up, right? Then we would write that here. Let's say we had like a six ohm resistor, just throwing some crazy numbers in there. So I'd say, okay, that drop is six times I1, which is one at an angle of zero, minus I2, which is uh, half an amp at uh, 42 degrees, whatever that works out to, multiply it by six ohms, and I've got the voltage across this resistor with that reference polarity. If I wanted the reverse reference polarity, plus on the bottom, minus on the top, then we would just reverse this order. We would treat I2 as uh, a reference, if you will, right? Minus to plus like this, minus on the top. And I would just say, well, it's I2 minus I1 rather than I1 minus I2. Or when I got all done, I could just stick a minus sign in there or flip the angle 180 degrees. Either way, I come up with the same value, okay? So this is the basic idea here. Now what we're gonna do is expand this out, look at some larger circuits, and uh, also consider what's gonna happen um, uh, as, as far as uh, an inspection technique. And here's something to think about. What happens if we have a current source in here? All right, maybe I have something out here. How do I treat that? Well, here's a clue for you. I could have a loop here and I could have a loop here. You know what? You already know what this loop is because that's the value of the current source. That could save you some time. Okay, we'll leave it there and pick this up next time with a nice example that we'll compute through.